Here's your bonus multiple choice review video for chapter nine. Now, number one, an opinion poll asks a random sample of adults whether they favor banning ownership of handguns by private citizens. A commentator believes that more than half of all adults favor such a ban. The null and alternate or alternative hypothesis you would use to test this claim are. Now, before I really get into the numbers up here, I'm just going to kind of scan through my options and see if there's anything that I definitely know is wrong. And there are some things that catch my eye here, like, oh, they're hypothesizing about the sample proportion. And we will know the truth about the sample proportion because it's from our sample. So that's definitely wrong. The other thing that catches my eye is in answer choice E for the null hypothesis, they're not using equals. So I know that's wrong. They're, they really kind of flip-flopped. It looks like maybe the null and alternate symbols there. Now for B, C, and D, the null uses equals. Uh, the alternate uses all appropriate signs, less than, greater than, not equal to signs. Uh, the null claim value and the alternate value match up. Um, and they're all using the population proportion P. So B, C, and D are really our only good viable options here. Now, to figure out what or what, which alternate hypothesis is really going on here, we need to look more into the problem. When it said a commentator believes that more than half, that's what we want the alternate hypothesis to be, that it should be more than half. And so that would follow up with answer choice B to be our correct answer here. Number two, oh my, we have a whole essay to read here. The power takeoff driveline on tractors, um, blah, 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 blah. There's a lot of stuff going on in here. They give us some hypotheses, and then they state which of the following is not a condition for performing the significance test. So to be quite honest with you, I don't really need to know a whole lot that's going on in this problem to really focus just on the conditions. So if you want to read all this, knock yourself out. So, A, both populations are normally distributed. Well, we do need a normal uh, sampling distribution, so yeah, maybe, I don't know, let, let's keep going. The data come from two independent samples. Well, we need random samples, right? Like, look at C, both samples are chosen at random, so this is definitely a good one. Now, why do they mention in B independent samples? And this is a two-sample problem up here. So I will tell you that about this particular problem. It is a two-sample problem. And in a two-sample problem, really we need our two random samples to be completely independent and separate from each other. So this really isn't a condition that I focus on in two-sample problems, but really your two samples should be completely separate or independent. So this one technically is true. D, the expected counts of successes and failures are large enough to use normal calculations. Now, this one sounds a lot more like our normal distribution check uh, because we need those successes and failures. And when they say are large enough, how large is large enough for our n times p and n times 1 minus p? Well, they need to be greater than or equal to 10. So they're not saying n times p and n times 1 minus p are greater than or equal to 10, but really that's what they're implying here with this situation. And so that is a condition that we need for doing uh, this type of proportion problem. E, both populations are more than 10 times the corresponding sample sizes. Well, that's the independent condition, which we do need to be true. So really it's A. A is the one that we don't need. We don't need the populations to come from normal distributions. Um, that was something more that we discussed in our um, mean chat, or not really mean chapter because we haven't gotten to means yet. Um, but when we did sampling distributions back in chapter seven, and we did do mean problems, we said one of the things that would count as the normal condition being verified for means was if the populations came from already normally distributed uh, values. And so this is going to be something more that we'll talk about uh, in the next two chapters when we get into means for confidence intervals and for hypothesis testing. All right, number three. 
To determine the reliability of experts who interpret lie detector tests in criminal investigations, a random sample of 280 such cases were studied. The results were, so we've got um, suspects' true status. They are innocent versus they're guilty. And consider, a lot of the times, we don't really know the true status of a suspect, right? Unless they tell us, like, oh, no, I did not do this. But do you believe them? Or if someone said, I totally did this crime, do you still 100% believe them? Or do you think that they're potentially lying to you? So it's hard to know for sure what the suspect's true status is. Uh, And then we have the examiner's decision. So the examiner, looking at the lie detector test results, is going to believe that based on the results that the uh, suspect is innocent or they're guilty. Now, you can see a lot of the times they're pretty good, right? They say, oh, they're totally innocent. And how often are they innocent? 131 times out of, we got to consider all the way across here, that all the times that they say innocent is 146 times, and they were right 131 out of 146 times. That's pretty good. Now, out of all the times that they say guilty, Well, there were 125 out of, and again, if I add these together here, out of 134 times. So they were only wrong 9 out of 134 times, which again is still pretty good, but again, they're not entirely 100% accurate. So I really like this problem. This is a problem that we've never really seen before, but if you understand the concept of what's going on here, we should be able to apply what we know to this situation. So it says, if the hypotheses are, and the null hypothesis is the suspect is innocent, because we're always going to assume that a suspect is innocent until proven guilty, versus the alternate that the suspect is guilty, this is what we want to prove is true, is that they are guilty. Which of the following is the best estimate of the probability that an expert commits a type 2 error? So we got to remember, a type 2 error is we fail to reject the null hypothesis, but really we should have rejected it. So just keep that in mind, right? I mean, we've talked about type two errors and type one errors, what they mean by definition, but let's see what that would look like in this situation. So we fail to reject the null hypothesis. So if we fail to reject, we think the truth is that the suspect is innocent. So the examiner is going to say innocent. So we're going to look at all of these situations here. Now, but really we should have rejected. Why should we really should have rejected? Because the suspect really is guilty, right? We think they're innocent, but really they're guilty is what a type two error is saying here. So how often is it that we get this wrong? So that would give us this probability of a type 2 error. Now, in general, we said that was beta or it's 1 minus power, but we don't have those numbers here, right? So just using our table, uh, altogether, there are 146 times that the examiner says innocent, right? They basically say fail to reject the null hypothesis. And how often out of those 146 times are we wrong? Are we committing a type two error? So again, we want to focus on those 15 times that he was technically wrong. So 15 out of 146 would be the probability, would be the estimate for the probability of a type two error. Now, what I think is very interesting here is the way that this problem is set up and how it really forces you to kind of think about type two errors. So I'm just curious, this would be kind of an extra uh, side problem here. What would be the probability that the expert commits a type one error? Think about that. See if one of the answer options, I don't even know if one of these answer options is really the type one error probability, but I would bet it probably is. And then I guess a a second side quest of this problem would be what's the probability of power? Ooh. Now, that one should be a lot easier considering the answer that we just figured out. But, but again, those are two side quest problems. Number four, a significance test allows you to reject a null hypothesis in favor of an alternate hypothesis at the 5% significance level. What can you say about significance at the 1% level? 
All right, so let's re-look back through this here. So they're saying a significance test allows you to reject the null hypothesis. Well, if we reject, if we reject the null hypothesis, then what must be true is that the p-value must be smaller than our alpha level, right? Our significance level. And they're saying that was at a 5% level. So we know we are dealing with a p-value that is smaller than 5%. So what can you say about significance at the 1% level? Oh, okay. Now, before I really dive in and trying to connect these two things here, I just want to look at my answer choices and see, are there any that definitely are not going to pass the test here? So we've got the null hypothesis can be rejected. There's insufficient evidence to reject the null hypothesis. There's sufficient evidence to... Wait, accept the null hypothesis? We never accept the null hypothesis. We either reject it or we fail to reject it. And some of you might be going, well, fail to reject the null hypothesis means we're accepting it, right? Not entirely. Uh, again, think of a court case. When we fail to reject a person's innocence, we're not really saying they're innocent. We're not accepting their innocence. We're just saying there is not enough evidence to prove that they're guilty, right? So accepting and failing to reject really sound like the same thing, but they're really not. So we never accept the null hypothesis. D, the alternate can be rejected. We never reject the alternate hypothesis, right? I mean, that's essentially equivalent-ish to failing to reject the null hypothesis. But again, our decision is always about rejecting the null hypothesis or failing to reject the null hypothesis. There are no other two possibilities. And then E, the answer can't be determined from the information given. Well, let's see. So we definitely knocked out C and D. Um, so let's start with A. The null hypothesis can be rejected at the 1% level. Well, that would be true if the p-value would be less than an alpha level of 1%. But what is the p-value exactly? All we knew from up here that it was less than 5%. Does that also mean that it's less than 1%? I don't know. What if the p-value was 3%? You know, if this was 3%, we would reject here, but we would fail to reject here at a 1% level. So we don't know the p-value. So we don't know if it's entirely less than 1%. So we don't know if A is true or not. I mean, it could be true, but we don't know for sure. Uh, B, there's insufficient evidence to reject the null hypothesis at the 1% level. So basically they're saying we cannot reject the null hypothesis. We fail to reject at the 1% level. Well, we would fail to reject if the p-value was not less than the alpha level. But again, what's the p-value? We know it's less than 5%, but is it somewhere between 1% and 5%? Or is it, in fact, less than 1%? And again, we don't know. We don't have that kind of information here. So truly, and this is one of those rare instances where you're like, oh, they had to throw in like a fifth answer choice that really never gets selected here. But in this scenario, it gets selected. We, we can't determine uh, what the answer is just based on the fact that the p-value is less than 5%. We need some more information here. Number five, a random sample of 100 likely voters in a small city produced 59 voters in favor of candidate A. The value of the standardized test statistic for performing a test of P equals 0.5 versus P is greater than 0.5 is which of the following? So our standardized test statistic is our Z, and the generic formula that is given to you on the AP exam is statistic minus parameter, statistic minus parameter, divided by the standard error. Now, the statistic is what we get from our sample. That would be p hat. The parameter is our population proportion, which in this scenario would be our hypothesized population proportion. So right now, we can at least try to knock out some answer options here just by considering what the numerator of this would be. So what did we see in our sample? Random sample of 100 produced 59. So P hat is 59% or 0.59. And what are we hypothesizing about our population proportion? Well, that it's 50%.
So we should have a numerator that says 59% minus 50%. So this one checks, this one checks. Ooh, they flip-flop. They did parameter minus statistic, not C. Same thing on D. And uh, E looks good up top. So we have statistic min minus parameter in A, B, and E. But now let's take a look down in the denominator. So the standard error, this formula is something that would be given to you on the AP Stats exam. And I would give it to you on the chapter test. And this is P times 1 minus P over N. So we need to be using the 0.5 downstairs. And this is using P hat downstairs, so it's not A. We look at B. Hey, that one's using 0.5, and 1 minus 0.5 would be another 0.5, and divided by the sample size is 100. So this one looks great. But let's go make sure that E, oh, E, they didn't do the P times 1 minus P. They just did divided by the square root of the sample size. So that is an incomplete, incorrect standardized test statistic. So the correct answer is B. All right, number six. A researcher claims to have found a drug that causes people to grow taller. The coach of the basketball team at Brandon University has expressed interest but demands evidence. Over a thousand Brandon students volunteer to participate in an experiment to test this new drug. Fifty of the volunteers are randomly selected. Their heights are measured and they are given the drug. Two weeks later, their heights are measured again. The power of the test. Power. To detect an average increase in height of one inch could be increased by. So they are asking us, how do we increase power? Now, there were three ways we could increase power, two of which were the main ways. Number one, we could increase the sample size. Number two, we could increase the alpha level. This was kind of like the cheater's way of increasing power. And then number three was to increase the distance away, or to increase the alternate distance away from the null hypothesis. And that's not really what we're going to be focusing on in this problem. So we want to increase power by increasing the sample size or increasing the alpha level. So, A, using only the 12 members of the basketball team in the experiment. Well, if we only use the 12 members instead of the 1,000 people here, no, hold on, sorry, they ended up using 50 of those 1,000 volunteers, um, technically they're decreasing the sample size in that problem, right? So that's not going to increase power. Using an alpha of 1% instead of 5%, well, they are saying decrease the alpha level, which is going in the wrong direction. Using alpha 5% instead of 1%, they are, in fact, increasing alpha here. So this one's looking good. Let's eliminate the others here. Given the drug to 25 randomly selected students instead of 50. Well, they're decreasing sample size, so that'll decrease power. And using a two-sided test instead of a one-sided test. That had nothing to do with power. So in fact, the correct answer is C, where they increased the alpha level. Number seven. A 95% confidence interval for the proportion of viewers of a certain reality television show who are over 30 years old is between 26 and 35%. Suppose the show's producers want to test the null hypothesis that the true proportion is 25% against the alternate hypothesis that the true proportion is not equal to 25%. Which of the following is an appropriate conclusion for them to draw at an alpha equals 0.05 significance level? Now, if we look at our answer options, we see nothing but um, good options, right? Failing to reject the null hypothesis versus rejecting the null hypothesis. Nothing quirky in there about like, you know, rejecting the alternate or failing to reject the alternate or accepting the null. Nothing out of there, nothing out of the ordinary. So the whole focus of this chapter has been about hypothesis testing, but now they're throwing in a confidence interval. And we said we're allowed to connect together a hypothesis test to a confidence interval if it is a two-sided hypothesis test. And we know it's a two-sided test because the alternate is using the not equal to sign here, which means we get to use both sides of our confidence interval. Now, the claim that they're wanting to test is that the true proportion is 25%. And the confidence interval is telling us that we're 95% confident that the true value of P, the population proportion, is between 26 and 
Now, I know that we said in our confidence interval chapter that confidence intervals aren't always 100% accurate, but we are going to go with that it's accurate in this scenario. So, how plausible is 25% of our null hypothesis claim if we're 95% confident that the true proportion is between 26 and 35? Well, this number is not contained in our confidence interval. We would reject the null hypothesis here. We would reject it because it is not seen in the confidence interval. So we wouldn't do option A or option B. C is looking good so far. We reject, we reject, we reject. Okay. So if we reject the null hypothesis, then we would say that we do have enough evidence. And instead of saying enough evidence, they're using the term convincing. So we would have convincing evidence, or we would have sufficient evidence. Well, answer choice C says there is not convincing evidence, but we are saying that there should be convincing evidence. So now D says there is convincing evidence. E says there is convincing evidence. Okay, well, let's see, where's the difference come into play? That the true proportion of the viewers of this, that the true proportion of the viewers of this, reality TV shows who are over 30 years old, who are over 30 years old, is greater than 25% versus differs from 25%. Now remember, we're always trying to conclude the alternate hypothesis, and the alternate was that it is not equal to, aka that it differs from 25%. So I would say that E is the correct option here. We were not just hypothesizing that it was greater. Now, clearly our confidence interval is showing us that we must have gotten a sample proportion result that was greater than 25%, but we didn't know that it was necessarily at the beginning of the problem going to be greater than 25%. They were just saying, we don't know which way of 25% it's going to go. That's why they use a two-sided test. Number eight, in a test of the null hypothesis, being that the true proportion is 40% against the alternate hypothesis that the true proportion is not equal to 40%, a random sample of size 100 yields a standardized test statistic of Z equals 1.28, which the following is closest to the p-value for this test. Ooh, so this is where you guys have to know how to calculate a p-value that's not directly from using you know, a, a one prop Z test or a two prop Z test, because that was the fast and easy way if we were given all the information. Now in this problem, they don't give us everything, right? They give us the null and alternate hypothesis, they give us the sample size, but they didn't tell us what happened in the problem, right? They didn't give us what the statistic was, what P hat was that would have resulted in a standardized test statistic of Z equals 1.28. Now, we could uh, solve for what p hat is, but they just want to know what's p. So how did we take this test statistic of 1.28 and how did we convert it into a p value? Well, we had to find the probability that we would find other test statistics that were uh, as extreme or more extreme than our 1.28 that we saw. And since this was a positive test statistic, we want to go greater than or equal to 1.28. If that had said negative 1.28, then we would have said less than or equal to negative 1.28. So we get to use normal CDF. And in this scenario, we are going to start at our positive 1.28, shoot off to infinity. We're on the right side of the distribution. And based on our standard normal distribution, we're going to use 0 and 1 as the mean and standard deviation. So now if I go to my calculator, and go 1.28 to 9999 with 0 and 1 mean and standard deviation, that gives me a p-value of 0 0.1003, which if you look at our options here, they're only going two decimal places, so we'll say 10%. Now, this is where a lot of people are going to go, well, there's the correct answer, and I would say wrong, and you go, but it's 10%. You said it's 10%. That's the p-value. And I'd go, yeah, but there's one other thing to consider in this problem. This p-value represents the one-sided p-value. And if I go look at my alternate hypothesis, it is using the not equal to sign, which means this is a two-sided test. 
So what do I need to do to a one-sided p-value to turn it into a two-sided p-value? I need to double that p-value. Because right now, in that sampling distribution, we know about 10% that's technically on the right side of the distribution. But since we were testing a two-sided test, we need to consider that it could have happened over on this other side. So the true p-value, the two-sided p-value, is actually 20%. That's the one thing that's going to catch people. Once you calculate a p-value, and this is really if you only do it by hand, then you have to go back up to the alternate and see, is this a one-sided or a two-sided test? Am I done at 10% or do I need to double it and say the answer is 20%? Now, if you were using a one-prop Z test or a two-prop Z test, then you get to decide in that calculator command what the alternate value is. You get to already tell it if it's one-sided or two-sided. And so if you tell the calculator, you know, the alternate is going to use a not equal to uh, sign here, then the p-value that it gives you is already the two-sided p-value, and you don't have to double it. All right, number nine. Bags of a certain brand of tortilla chips claim to have a net weight of 14 ounces. A representative of a consumer advocacy group wishes to see if there is convincing evidence that the mean net weight is less than advertised and so intends to test the hypotheses that the null hypothesis is... Wait a second. Why is this about means? I thought this whole chapter was about proportions. That is true. This whole chapter is about proportions, but... This problem is going to focus on a type 1 error. So it doesn't really matter if we're doing a mean or proportion problem. We are going to test, in general, a type 1 error. So the null hypothesis is the mean weight really is 14 ounces. So this is, we're saying, that the tortilla chip company is telling us the truth. Okay, So we're going to go with the claim that it's 14 ounces. What the consumer advo advocacy group wishes to show is that the tortilla chip company is lying. You live on a lie, no, a throne of lies. Is that from Elf? So they want to show that the mean weight is actually less than 14 ounces. So a type 1 error in this situation. So what is a type 1 error? Type 1 error is when we reject the null hypothesis, but we shouldn't have. We should have failed to reject, right? We should have failed to reject the null hypothesis. So let's consider what that means in the situation. Uh, we reject the null. So we reject this. We think, we think this is the truth. Now, if the mean is less than 14 ounces, if you look at the vocabulary that they're using uh, in the answer options, they're using underfilled. Um, and then really that they are or they aren't. So if the mean is less than 14 ounces, that means that they're underfilling the bags. They're underfilled. So we think they are being underfilled, but really they are not being underfilled, right? If it was the null hypothesis, that means that they're, they're right on target, right? 14 ounces, 14 ounces, we're good to go. They are being filled at the appropriate level. So we think they're being underfilled when in fact they're not being underfilled. Now that really matches up with answer choice A right off the bat here. They are being underfilled, right? We think the alternate hypothesis is what we should be going with, but when they really aren't, they really aren't being underfilled. So that is the null. So that matches up perfectly here. Now, there was one scenario in E where they actually used the term overfilled, uh, but if you consider overfilled would be over 14 ounces, and we're not even considering that scenario. So we knew from the beginning that we could have crossed that one out. Now, a little side quest problem again. Which of those options would be a type 2 error? Whoa. Think about that. We can talk about that in class. And, and the last problem. Conference organizers wondered whether posting a sign that says, please take only one cookie, would reduce the proportion of conference attendees who take multiple cookies from the snack table during a break. To find out, the organizers randomly assigned 212 attendees to take their break in a room where the snack table had the sign posted, and 189 attendees to take their break in a room where the snack table did not have a sign posted. In the room without the sign posted, 
24.3% of attendees took multiple cookies. In the room with the sign posted, 17% of attendees took multiple cookies. Is this decrease, right? They went from 24 to 17%, so that is a decrease. But is that decrease what we would call statistically significant? Statistically significant is another phrase that means, is it enough that we would reject the null hypothesis at the alpha equals 0.05 level? Now, this is almost a perfect two prop Z test problem here. Uh, but the problem is, in fact, they don't tell us how many people out of the 212 and how many people out of the 189. They told us the percentages of the 212 and the percentage of the 189. So to use a two prop Z test, we need to know the numerator and the denominator of our sample proportions. And they just, in fact, gave us the sample proportions as percentages. So if we want to use a two prop Z test to quickly get the P value and not have to muck through the entire formula for this problem, we need to do a little configuration here. All right, so for 17% of attendees took multiple cookies in the room with the sign posted. Okay, uh, the 212 attendees had the sign posted in there. So what is 17%, 17 percent, 17 percent of 212 people? And again, that'll tell us how many people really did take multiple cookies. So that ends up being, I get my calculator 36.04. I'm going to bet it's 36 people. And they just rounded the 17 percent, you know, 17 point something down to a nice 17%. All right, what is now, what was our other number? 24.3% of 189. So what's 24.3% of 189 people? And my calculator tells me that is 45.927. So again, I'm going to bet that's really 46 people. 46, because if I put my calculator, 46 divided by 189, I get 0.243386, and that would round to 24.3% to the nearest tenth. So I would say these represent my actual uh, numbers of people out of those sample sizes. So uh, let's see here. We have 36 out of 212, and we have 46 out of 189. Um, we are actually looking for a decrease. So this would be a one-sided test. I don't know. Let's see. Da -da 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 -da. So this one's a little bit trickier because, oh, no, wait, hold on. Would reduce the proportion. So this is actually a one-sided test. Uh, now, if they had not said reduce the proportion and they just said, like, we wonder if this will make a difference, then we would have had to have done a two-sided test. So just a one-sided test here, which if I look at my answer options and I look at these numbers here, uh, 0.068 is twice the amount of 0.034. I'm thinking they want us to think that this is a two-sided test and we would have to double. So if I had to use logic here, I would bet that probably the p-value we're going to be finding is 3.4% and we are not going to end up doubling it because it's not a two-sided test. So let's see if we can just use logic here, and then I'll just double check it with the calculator. So is the decrease statistically significant? Would we reject the null hypothesis? Well, if I think, just again, based on logic here, that the p-value is going to be 3.4%, and that is less than 5%, I would reject the null hypothesis, and I would find the results statistically significant. So Based on pure logic alone, without doing really any calculations, I would guess the answer is C, that yes, it is statistically significant because the p-value is smaller than the alpha level. Now, if I wanted to double check, I could go over, hit the stat button, go over to tests. Let's do a two-prop Z test. X1, let's just do 36. N1, 212. X2, 46 into 189. And then let's see, let's make the alternate hypothesis. Um, let's see, which way do we want it to go? We want the greater than P2. We want it to show a decrease. 
All right, and then my calculator says the p-value is 0 0.034. So it really is 3.4%. So I am fully satisfied with answer choice C. And that is all for your bonus multiple choice review video.